Hi there. Welcome to our revision webinar on unemployment and inflation in the UK economy. We're going to start off tonight by looking at unemployment. Here are some key terms, some key unemployment definitions that you might want to have readily to hand. But of course, there are two measures of unemployment in the UK. The, the claimant count is the number of people claiming the job seekers allowance. That figure is substantially less than the figure for the Labour Force survey, which uh, is all those people who are able, actively seeking and available for work, uh, whether or not they're claiming benefits. We need to make a key distinction between how long people are unemployed for. We'll look at the data in a second. Long term unemployed, technically, people have been out of work for at least a year. And uh, some people are suggesting we may be getting close to full employment. One definition of full employment is when there are enough unfilled job vacancies for all the unemployed to take work. Again, we'll look at vacancies in a few minutes. Many people of working age in the UK uh, are basically who have given up the search for work and uh, we call those people discouraged workers. They're a relatively small number, but it's very hard to capture just how big that group is. What we do know is there are about eight and a half million people in the UK who are of working age, but not in work or actively seeking work. We call those people the economically inactive. Now, there are many reasons for this. Raising a family, looking after a, a caring for an elderly relative, uh, staying in full-time education. Of the, of the eight and a half million who are economically inactive, around six million aren't looking for work. They don't want a job. There are other reasons for them uh, staying outside the labour market. The employment rate is a percentage of the population in work, be it full-time or part-time. Of course, the unemployment rate is the percentage of the economically active population that is unemployed. Indeed, if we look at the unemployment rate in the UK, this is what we see. A percentage of people uh, without a job, been actively seeking work in the last four weeks, and who can start work in the next fortnight. As you can see, the long-term trend in unemployment is downwards. With each successive peak since the early 1980s, the rate of unemployment has come down from about 12 to just under 11 to just over 8. So clearly the labour market in some senses is getting better at um, getting people back into work. That's good news. And of course in the last two or three years there's been a significant fall in unemployment. from Just over 8% to approaching 5% now. How many vacancies are, are there? Well according to the official measure uh, through to the summer of last year there were about 750 unfilled job vacancies. So just let's say three quarters of a million job vacancies. Well, there's about 1.6 million unemployed. So if you do the quick calculation, there's about two unemployed per job. And uh, clearly that will vary from locality, by region, by age, by sector. But uh, we're getting relatively close to a situation where there are two unemployed for each job. The number of vacancies in the UK has risen by about 100,000 in the last year or two which is clearly good news but getting those people into work getting those jobs filled is, is the big challenge of course UK unemployment can be seen in the context of unemployment rates in other countries so this chart shows unemployment in the European Union a selection of countries here Greece and Spain are the outliers with uh, horrendously high rates of unemployment in excess of 20 22 percent uh, the European Union as a whole has an, an unemployment rate of about 10%. The euro area and the single currency is slightly higher at 11%. So the UK actually looks relatively good using this data. Then if we disaggregate and go into the UK at regional level, again we get some interesting figures. So this data is from last year. The unemployment rate in the UK was 5.6. It's now a bit lower. But you can see here the regional breakdown. So the South East, the South West have the lowest unemployment rates, less than 5%, whereas areas such as the North East, over 8%. And London, of course, has very high unemployment. Lots of people who work in London don't live in London. Plenty of local areas of unemployment should significantly above the national average. And then, of course, if we disaggregate by age, we have the issue of youth unemployment. I think we've done a separate topic video on youth unemployment, if you want to Google that. Youth unemployment spiked really quite sharply in 2008-2009. It seemed to be the case that uh, lots of young people had found work in the preceding years and then when the crisis hit, it was nearly always a case of, or often a case of, uh, last in, first out. And the unemployment rate went up to nearly 20%. And 
And so two or three years ago, that was the hot topic in the labour market. How, how best to address this, this issue of youth unemployment. Since then, the figures have come down, which is clearly welcome. We're about 13% now. Uh, still significantly higher than it was 10, 12 years ago. And keep in mind, of course, it's two and a half times the unemployment rate in the UK as a whole. So youth unemployment's an issue that's not going to go away sometime soon. The other big disaggregation is how long people are unemployed for. So this chart shows the duration of unemployment in the UK. Um, and again, colour coding here, the blue bit is people who've been unemployed for less than half a year. And as we enter 2015, it's just under a million people. And then the, the colour bits uh, above, the orange, the, the grey and the yellow, are people who've been unemployed for at least six months, over a year and over two years. And I think that's, that's, that has to be one of the key challenges in the labour market. How can we get the long term, often structurally unemployed, back into work? Another issue uh, which we're just looking at tonight is the issue of underemployment. So these are people who are in work but they may actually be looking for an extra job or actively searching for a new job with more than their existing hours. Now, nobody can be precisely sure what the level of underemployment is. But the ONS do publish the data. And in 2015, they reckon that underemployment was just under 3 million people. So though unemployment has been falling quite sharply, as you can see, underemployment has been increasing. Nearly 3 million people particularly are they looking for an extra job or they want to work longer hours in the existing occupation. And the key revision point is that underemployment can be rising as we see, even though unemployment is actually going down. Another feature of the labour market in the UK has been the rise of part-time employment. So part-time employment as a percentage of the total has gone up from about 24% in 1992 to about 27% now. So... Put simply, just over a quarter of part-time jobs, sorry, a quarter of all jobs are part-time. Uh, and the percentage of people who are part-time who could not find a full-time job, well, that's actually gone up quite a bit. So it's about 16% now, as opposed to 8% 10 years ago. Linked to this, I suppose, is the, the increasing flexibility of employment contracts and the rise of zero-hours contracts. I'm sure you've read about this in the news. Uh, people on zero hours contracts are not guaranteed any minimum number of hours per week. On average, they actually work about 24 to 26 hours a week. And about one third of people on them would like to work more. But uh, typically, zero hours contracts, people tend to be younger. They're often part time. They're more likely to be female than people in other jobs. And we're now at a stage where there's just under 800,000 zero hours contracts about two and a half percent of the labor force and again big issues there about the trade-off between efficiency and flexibility and uh, income volatility because you're never quite sure how many hours you're going to work so the big picture i suppose the big story is that um, the uk economy has been growing steadily certainly since fears of a double dip disappeared in 2012 on the left hand side here you see the growth rate of gdp the quarterly growth and uh, that steady growth of around 0.5% uh, per quarter, just over 2% a year, has been helping to bring down the unemployment rate down to 5%. How much further can that rate fall, we ask ourselves? Well, the government's clearly trying to reduce unemployment. Here are some examples of policies introduced in the budget to stimulate jobs. Uh, the government has been keen to cut corporation tax. It's uh, currently 20%. It'll fall to 19% and the aim is to, to reduce it to 17% by 2020, clearly designed to stimulate investment. The government's also increased the threshold at which people pay the 40% higher income tax rate. That's going to go up to £45,000 next year. Part that, partly that is people who are in fairly well-paid full-time work who, who risk getting dragged into higher tax brackets, so-called fiscal drag. Small businesses have been given some help recently. Uh, this threshold for tax relief on business rates has, has uh, gone up and small businesses, for example, have now a national insurance um, contribution discount if they employ, for example, a long-term unemployed worker. Government is trying to fast forward and 
accelerate the process of infrastructure investment. So it's likely that Crossrail 2 will go ahead. It likely it'll happen before HS, HS2. And of course the HS3 link, high speed rail link, Northern Powerhouse project is, is looking pretty good. Uh, again, it'll probably happen before HS2. Cutting the tolls on seven river crossings is really a way to try and improve geographical mobility. But ge generally, the kind of debate I suppose one could think about is how, how can we get unemployment down below 5%? Is there a flaw to the rate of unemployment in a modern economy such as the UK? Uh, I would argue that to get unemployment below 5%, you have got to really have another three or four years of sustained growth, keeping the cycle reasonably stable, um, you know, generating the output, which generates also the jobs. We need more balanced growth between regions. It's clear the regional unemployment issue is a fundamental one. Uh, if you've been following what's been happening in the steel industry, what's been happening in uh, areas, localities heavily dependent on steel and related supply chain businesses, it's clear that regional policy is now very important in the UK. You need, to, you need policies to make work pay, so that perhaps the higher minimum wage is a way of increasing the wedge between in-work pay and, uh, and benefits. Although, of course, there's a potential risk that people will, there'll be fewer jobs as a result of the minimum wage. You need investment to pay. So you need, uh, you need people who are incentivized to become graduates and then find suitable work. Flexible labor markets are useful. I think the fall in unemployment in the UK has been a major factor, but um, flexible labor markets really help that. But you know, you need the flexible labor market to absorb shocks, economic shocks, but equally you need sufficient flexibility so that wages can rise as well as fall. Fundamentally, the green point though is that we need to reskill the workforce in a fast changing, ever changing labor market. People need new skills, they need new aptitudes. So things like increasing investment in STEM, science, technology, engineering and maths, offering more courses in coding and computer science and more languages, for example, a bigger variety of languages. These are important occupational, uh, functional policies for the labour market. The best policies to use unemployment focus on what, the, what are the big causes, the underlying causes. Just a few words on inflation. So the picture on unemployment is pretty good. Um, on inflation, of course, you should be familiar that uh, the rate of inflation in the UK last year was pretty much zero, it was 0.1% on average well below the government's 2% target. So 2015 was a year of low inflation. I mean, Britain is not a high inflation country, as this chart shows. The most recent peak was inflation of just under 5% in 2011. And anybody of any age, including myself, will remember the inflation of the 1970s and the 1980s. So 2015 was a year of low inflation. And indeed, uh, in some cases, prices were falling. If you look here on the Consumer price index. The, the 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 dark black line is the is the overall inflation rate. Uh, the the blue bit is inflation in services, things like haircuts and school fees and insurance policies and things. Um, whereas in red, there's been some deflation, some negative inflation, particularly in things like tech, tech goods, textiles, clothing, footwear, that kind of stuff. There's been some genuine deflation. They'd have to drag that index into negative inflation rate. Uh, inflation is quite volatile. What I've done here is taken out changes in volatile oil and gas, food, alcohol and tobacco. Uh, and if you do that, you get an orange line, which is called core CPI. And basically core CPI since 2005 has varied between 1% and just over 3%. So for the last 12 years, we've had inflation, we've had price stability of between 1% and 3%. Um, you know, that inflation has barely been an issue. Of course, it was in 2011 with 5% inflation, but a lot of that was to do with oil prices, gas prices going up, and food prices. And again, this, this chart takes you through the CPI constituent parts. So it's a stacked bar chart. And it basically, if you take the whole thing, inflation has been falling recently. But why? Well, because gas prices have been coming down, fuel bills have been falling, petrol has become cheaper. Um, some food and drink have become cheaper, partly there's a price war in the supermarkets and things. So we have had some deflation in food and drink, in utility bills and in things like petrol. And that's been keeping inflation down, although other things have been going up. Education has been going up, uh, motor insurance, that kind of stuff has been rising. 
So why is inflation in the UK so low? Well, lots of factors. Um, you know, one is that the global headwinds have been fairly negative for inflation. We know that oil prices have fallen in the last year or two, from over $100 a barrel to about, uh, I think about $40 at the moment. Wages, painfully slow growth of wages for those people in the labour market, desperately waiting for a big pay rise. So wages growing about 1% or 2%. That's uh, for most of us. Uh, some people, of course, get bonuses a little bit faster than that. Food prices have been falling, in part because of price wars in the supermarkets. But generally, there's been some fairly good climatic conditions for fresh fruit and veg and things. Technology is a kind of long-term factor keeping inflation low. There's a kind of, there's a kind of underlying deflation in the price of the techie goods, like you know, smartphones and cameras and, and uh, Fitbits and things. And generally, I think two, two key points. The, the growth rate in the economy is actually slowing down. UK growth this year is forecast to be about 2%. And you know, 2% growth isn't particularly fast. It's not going to cause too much in the way of demand pull inflation. And by most estimates, there's still a little bit of spare capacity on the supply side. The output gap in the UK is estimated by most commentators to be still to be um, negative. Not massively so maybe 1% or 2% of potential GDP. But uh, there's no, we don't really have a booming economy at the moment. Growth is pretty stable at around 2%. And that's another key reason why inflation is low. And why the Bank of England is um, not tempted to raise interest rates sometime soon. My last point, of course, is that inflation is quite difficult to forecast. So you're never quite sure what the inflation rate is going to be. If you look at the Bank of England's inflation um, uh, forecasts, for the two years ahead, there's always a, a nice rivers of blood fan chart, which gets wider the further you look ahead. Inflation is pretty hard to forecast. Uh, governments can change indirect taxes. Um, energy prices are volatile. A currency can move up and down. We're never quite sure about the price of food and, and the exchange rate and that kind of stuff and, and the general growth of the economy. So inflation is pretty hard to forecast. But we know at the moment inflation in the UK is a... <laughs> It's fairly stable. It's somewhere between 1% and 2%. It's a bit low at the moment. It'll ledge up. It depends what happens to the pound, I suppose. But inflation is not a fundamental problem. If anything, probably the risks lie towards deflation instead of inflation. So there we go. This has been a journey through some of the data on unemployment and inflation in the UK so that uh, you have a contextual awareness and uh, you can hopefully apply this data to the theories and the ideas that... Uh, been covering in your economics lessons. Thanks a lot, take care and see you soon.